Ready when y'all are. I guess we're ready. <clears throat> are you going to call it the order? Sunny. Sunny's going to take care of the first one. All righty. I guess we'll call the meeting to order at 1 31 p.m. Um, this will be a roll call. When we when you hear your name, please press the button on your microphones to turn your buttons on and let us know if you're present. Ms. Desiree Aikens. I'm here. Thank you. Mr. Wayne McLean. Present. Thank you. Mr. James Norwood. Present. Thank you. Mr. John Vanderwerf. Present. Ms. Lysandra Williams. Present. We have a quorum. Yes, so they can read it. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Thank you, Sunshine. Thank you. Thank you. Your first time being sworn to this board, and this is my first time swearing people in. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna read and you're just gonna repeat after me. When we get to where it says I, you will say your name, okay? So I do solemnly, solemnly swear to affirm that I will faithfully perform the duties of my appointed office I, James Norwood, all together. Do, I, James Norwood, do solemnly swear to an affirm. I will faithfully perform the duties of my appointed office. And I will, and I will support and honor. And I will support and honor to the best of my ability. To the best, to the best of my ability. All applicable laws of the state of Florida. All applicable laws of the state of Florida, Putnam County, Putnam County, the city of Palatka, the city of Palatka, doing my tenure, doing my tenure on the on the city of Palatka tax increment fund advisory committee, on the city of Palatka tax increment fund advisory committee. I hereby through this oath. I hereby Bye through this oath affirm that I will perform the duties. Affirm, affirm that, that I will perform, perform the duties of this public trust and affair. Of this, of this public, public trust, trust and affair, affair, equitable and ethical manner befitting, equitable ethical and ethical, ethical manner, manner befitting the dignity and responsibilities of the office. The dignity and responsibilities of the office. Yes, please. Welcome aboard and congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to everyone and thank you. The next item of business is the election of a chair and vice chair. Anybody have any nominations amongst you? We, we have a, I think I like the person that's sitting in the penalty. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> I, oh, I'm sorry. You hadn't voted yet. I'm sorry. So we have a nomination and a second for Ms. Atkins to be the chair of the committee. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Congratulations, Madam Chairman. 
now we need a vice chair. Same method. I think Jerry Norwood would be awesome. I think Lysandra Reeves would be great. Okay. Is that a second? a second? Okay, so we've got a nomination and a second for Ms. Williams to be the vice chair. He nominated him first. I know, I know but you didn't, you didn't do a second quick enough. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Congratulations, Madam Vice Chair. Okay. How did that happen? Madam Chair, um, I will um, step forward now and do the overview of the Sunshine Law and the Robert Rules of Order. As you know, as Mr. Norwood has previously advised us, everything is in your, your binder that you receive. I'm just going to go over some highlights. I know that you are all very, all of you are very well abreast of um, Sunshine Law and the Robert Rules of Order. And um, oh, and I forgot, I'm Valeria Thomas, I'm the city attorney. So if you have any questions, you know, just raise your hand as we go along, okay? Um, open government overview, which is called the Sunshine Law. It um, provides for access to governmental proceedings at both the state and local levels. In the absence of statutory exemption, it applies to any gathering or two or more members of the same board to discuss some matter which will foreseeably come before the board for action. Okay, so anytime that you have two or more members, even if it's <laughs> casual outing or things like that, you probably need to advertise, take minutes, and um, give notice that you're going to be together. I know um, some of you may have seen these um, advertisements or notices that we have published in the Palaka Daily News. If the board of the city commission is going to go someplace or they're going to, two or more are going to be in the same location, we advertise that. And whether they um, discuss any business that uh, may become before, the possibility arises that they may do that. And so we give people the opportunity to be there and that they're noticed that they will be present. Okay, um, the scope of the Sunshine Law, there are three basic requirements. Meetings of public boards or commission must be open to the public. And as you can see, we have the public here today because this was noticed and advertised. <clears throat> Reasonable notice of such meetings must be provided and minutes of the meeting must be prepared and open for public inspection. Um, it applies to all advisory boards, like this is one of them. This is a new board that we have created. And so therefore, you're going to see notices anytime that you're going to meet or possibly be two or more of you together. <clears throat> Staff meetings are not um, subject to the Sunshine Law and only the legislature can create an exemption. And this is just a, a, a really good point that board members should not ask staff to talk to other board members to sort of poll them as to how they might vote. That's a violation of the Sunshine Law, okay? So <clears throat> we were, are here to facilitate anything that needs to be done, but not as a, a liaison to poll other board members. Okay, public records. Okay, the penalties, civil action, criminal penalties, suspension or removal from office. All right, that's a penalty for violating the Sunshine Law. Public records is chapter 119. And like I said, I'm just trying to hit the highlights because I know you are all have committed this to memory. Um, public records means all documents, papers, letters, maps, books, just means everything. Okay, made or received pursuant to law ordinance or in connection with the transaction of official business. And it's by any agency on behalf of a public agency, which may be used to um, perpetuate, communicate, or formulate knowledge. Um, public records cannot be, we cannot be withheld at the request of the sender. One of the big um, questions has been, and it's been litigated many times in this state, is that people wanna know who is asking for a public record 
why they want the records. You cannot ask those questions. We have people come in every day asking for public records and um, you cannot ask them who they are. If they don't want to tell you, fine. If they tell you, well, you know, you say, well, I just want to know so I can mail it to you. Well, I'll come back and pick it up. That's sufficient, All right? Fees, um, there's a fee schedule. You don't have it included, but it's like um, 15 cents per page. And I think it's 20, 25% for a double-sided page. But, um, and then if you need um, inordinate work in order to compile a public records, because there's a lot of documents and things like that, then we can charge for the copying fees as well as the work that it takes to uh, um, compile those documents. And that's only uh, the salary rate of the, um, the least paid um, employee that's involved in compiling those documents. You can't ask, you know, Ms. if you ask for public records, we can't charge Ms. Mandy's hourly rate. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me see what else. Penalty for non-compliance, the same thing for public records failure to produce public records. Criminal penalty, civil action, and attorney's fees. Any questions? Okay, parliamentary procedures. Sorry. <laughs> parliamentary procedures. Um, it is a code of rules and ethics for working together in groups. It was developed by the US Army. Um, and the, it was a major called um, Roberts. He's the one that developed the rules in order to have an orderly progression and um, organization of meetings and communications. Um, some of the big um, questions when you're doing Rob, um, parliamentary procedure is that you have a quorum. You notice at the beginning of this, Ms. Krantz called the um, roll call to make sure who was present. And the quorum, um, by definition, is more than one half of the active membership. Majority is more than one half of those voting. Two thirds majority is two thirds or more of the, um, the, the members who are voting. Um, another big question is the motions. You have to have a motion. Ms. Williams, like you said, um, Mr. <laughs> McLean made a motion, but no one seconded it. So that died for lack of a second. And then another motion came up and they were seconded. And so now, therefore, you are the vice chair. Um, the effective published agenda before the meeting, call the meeting to order on time. Just all of the things that you see on your agenda, those are the effective tools and rules of parliamentary procedure. Um, oh, and Ms. Atkins, um, as the chair, in order for anyone to speak, you must recognize them. Okay. And before they are allowed, to, even the public, as well as your fellow committee members. Um, the chair may not make motions unless you pass the gavel to someone else, okay? Um, chair only votes to make or break a tie unless the chair is a full member. The chair preserves order and decorum. Vice chair, someone who acts as the chair in his or her absence. Yes. Okay. Don't. Yes. Yes. I said unless the chair is a full member. <laughs> yes. Any questions, concerns, and um, just just wanted to bring up another thing, Ms. Atkins. You are allowed to maintain decorum among the membership as well as the public. So that's what the gavel is for. All right. Thank you. Any questions? Perfect time. So um, quickly, for those of you who, who don't know me, my name is Mandy Tucker. I'm gonna be working with you on behalf of the staff of the Community Redevelopment Agency. We are here as the Building Improvement Cost Fair Program is in its first cycle. It requires a committee to meet, to score and rank the applications that are complete. The program itself is intended to encourage 
the redevelopment of blighted residential and commercial properties by assisting those who are attempting to improve properties, which are most in need of rehabilitation or remodeling. They do not necessarily depend upon the grant funds to move forward and which have a greater probability of successful completion. To be considered eligible, the projects must be located in the City of Palatka Community Redevelopment Agency Tax Increment District and advance the goals outlined, outlined in the CRA plan. <coughs> so before we go any further, does anybody have any questions about that part? So this meeting was mainly to get y'all together, to get sworn in, elected officials, and to distribute the applications. We're not going to be going over the individual applications today. Um, I'm gonna to be passing out to each of you and I can send this to you digitally if you like to work digital as well. Um, it's an Excel spreadsheet, which will do the math for you on the computer, but it's a grading rubric. So it includes a column for each of the properties <coughs> in each of the categories that need to be scored. So as you look at this on the left column, organized by district. So we have nine applications for the central business district that were complete. One for the south tip that was complete and one for the north tip that was complete. As you look through the applications, you're gonna be grading them on project quality between zero and 25 points. So the, at the bottom, we listed the definitions according to the program documents for each category. So project quality is the quality of the proposed improvements, whether it be material, design, and construction method, and adherence to historic standards. These projects with approved certificate of appropriateness when necessary, and all applicable building permits will receive priority. The next category is project feasibility. The level of detail and accurateness of the project scope of work, budget, and plans within the application. And then redevelopment impact. The degree to which grant funds are be applied in eliminating blight and stabilizing or increasing property values in the immediate area. Now, as y'all are reading through the applications at home or at work or wherever you're gonna do it at the coffee shop, um, if you have any questions or need further information or clarification on a particular application, I'd ask that you email me so that I can find out the answer and then distribute the question and the answer to the entire committee so that everybody's playing with the same information. So what we'd like to have happen is so that at the time, I don't know how long um, each of you will need in order to do the applications. Like I said, there's 11, they're fairly long. I think each of them is about between five and 10 pages. So we need to figure out how long y'all want to give yourselves to look through and score and rank the applications so that we can set a date for the next meeting. And at the next meeting, which will also be open to the public. The applicants can come and sit in here. And if you have individual questions that you want to ask during that meeting of the applicant, that's more than acceptable. And then we'll go through each application at that time. You can all give your ranking and then we'll see how they fall and make a list that's certified that you then recommend to the CRA board. Does that make sense? Does that yes, make but I got a question. Yes, sir. You know, if I'm at home and I'm going over these and I've got questions and the question that I have may affect my ranking. Yes, sir. And how do, do, do I not score them and, and wait until we oh. get? No, sir. That's when you could either text or email me your question and which application it's about. And I will contact that applicant, get their answer and distribute it to the entire board. Okay. So that everybody knows the, the new information. Okay. Okay. Great. Madam Chair, I have a question. May I? Yes. Um, so, it, uh, and forgive my ignorance in this first time doing this. Mm -hmm. So uh, has staff, does staff make recommendations prior to this or do their research? Prior, if if something is blatantly missing from the application, do they tell the grantee? 
It was, um, it's on the agenda. There so, were four applications that were not eligible or not complete. So when it gets past staff and it has met the minimum qualifications? All 11 applications are considered complete. Okay, got it. thank you. You're welcome. But, but if, I don't, if you don't uh, mind, not to interject, and I don't know if you've already covered this, non um, you do need to understand that, that um, you, you don't have to, if it doesn't obtain a minimum score, it doesn't have to get in the loop. Yes. <laughs> you know, people have not traditionally had a hard time hearing me, but having said that, I want to make sure that the point was made that uh, eligible, meaning it's met the criteria, the application is complete, et cetera. But I think a key for you to understand is that if it doesn't reach your minimum scoring, it doesn't have to be considered eligible for receipt of funds. So in the past, there had been a time, and that's part of what we tried to correct, was there had been a, a process where if you were the only applicant, even if the project didn't really stack up, uh, if there was no other project that was being proposed, then you technically were eligible to receive the grant money. This time, uh, even if you are the only applicant, when you apply the criteria, we try to come up with objective criteria, which can be viewed differently in your eyes, obviously an objective, it's an objective criteria, but your assessment of it can be different, like on any board. And if when you get, if we get you, you back together, um, y'all don't find that an application meets the minimum point threshold, which should be on there, then it doesn't have to be granted any funds, okay? okay. Right. Question, Madam Chair. Yes. I'm assuming that everyone that has filled out the application that has, that has got to this point is eligible, right? Eligible meaning they've eligible for the funds. filled in the blocks. Doesn't mean that they've met the minimum point score. That's for y'all to decide. Okay. By the way, Commissioner, I'm glad to see your beard's as gray as mine now. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. I, I want to make sure that, you know, because if, I guess if I'm going to take the time to go over the application and, and that they're not eligible, um, so you guys have that staff has not determined eligibility. I think I understand what you're saying. I'm sorry. That's right. Is um, every application that has been handed to you has turned in the required information for you to determine the worth of the project and score it accordingly. Okay, I, I get it. Yes, ma'am. And one final thing, just to make sure that maybe uh, the, what we contemplated is is uh, conveyed. We don't necessarily contemplate that you're going to take these home and you're going to complete your consideration of the application in your vacuum in a vacuum. I think the whole idea was you'll come back, you'll have already be you'd be familiar with the application, you'll already have your tentative scoring of the application. But the whole idea of having the second hearing is so that you'll have the opportunity to ask the applicant questions and then collegially y'all will be able to, you know, move forward with to complete your 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 assessment. Um, otherwise, I mean, it would be kind of, as you say, even though Mandy's, I think her process is, is very good where you you ask a question, that's public record. Her response will go to each of you. That'll be public record as well. So you'll all get the same information, both the question and the answer. But then you may come here with still more questions and uh, only that you wanna ask the applicant live should they appear. And, and it's only fair that everybody be able to change their point total rankings or whatever based on what you receive at that second hearing. That's the way it was contemplated. So all applicants then meets the criteria to be an applicant. Yes, that okay, is there correct. You go. Yes, the minimum score required to be considered for funding is 70. I'm going to double check myself on that. Yes. Yes, you had a question. I do. Um, under the scoring criteria within project quality, it states an adherence to historic standards. Is there something within our packet that identifies what the historic standards are, or is that something that we're going to cover at a later time? Because 
I don't know what the historic standards are to be completely honest with you. <laughs> exactly. So, um, and I don't have a lot of dealings with the historic board, but the North and the South tip are also historic districts. Okay. So there are historic standards within there. So as you're reading those two applications, should any questions of that nature arise, again, send them to me and I'll confer with Ms. Walsh, the planning director who is above the historic board and we'll find the best answer I can for you. Typically something that requires a certificate of appropriateness, that's something they would go to the historic board for. Okay. Or get a staff letter. Thank you. You're welcome. You look like you have another question. <laughs> but design. Yes, sir. Would be a criteria for historic standards, wouldn't it? In some instances, yes. It could. Color? Color could very well be, yes, a paint, a paint so, color in a house. So let me ask another question. Okay. Then. Is it, are we, well, should the historic boards actually look at these applications and say it and tell us whether it meets historic standards or not prior to? Well, according to our rubric, applicants who had already done that and gotten their certificate of appropriateness when necessary would receive priority. So you can take into account, does this need historic um, um, standards? And if the answer is yes, it would have historic standards, but they don't have that COA. That's something that you could potentially decide to take off points for. Yes, ma'am. A sub question after that statement, if they don't have the COA, how long would it take for them to obtain that document? It depends on whether or not it's something that staff can write a letter for. Okay. Um, if it's something that is able to be approved by staff, that typically doesn't take very long. If it needs to be approved by the board, it would take at least the next meeting of okay. the historic board. And I don't know how often they meet. Yeah. We're almost to public comment. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we? move to public comment on the process. So what staff will do once we have decided on a date for the next, a date and a time for the next meeting is I will, or we will send out um, an email to all the applicants informing them of the date and the time, giving them plenty of opportunity to plan to be here to answer any direct questions. This process is based off of the way that the Department of State runs their historical grants, which we've sat through several times as grantees. And um, it tends to work very well. So you'll have plenty of opportunity to ask them questions. Okay. No more questions? Okay. Hey, one other thing. Yes, sir. We, what we would be doing is making recommendations back to the city commission, right? Back to the CRA, CRA board. Yeah, yes, board. and okay. then the CRA board will make the recommendations. Okay, to the commission. To the okay, commission. all right. Yes, I just want to make sure. Yes. Yeah, we'll, um, you as a, co as a committee will generate a ranked list and recommend the funding amounts for each project. Okay. Any other questions or comments at this time? No. Okay. We can open up the floor to public comment. If you are going to speak, um, if you can, please do fill out a yellow card and hand it to Ms. McKenna at the computer so that she can write down names and addresses. Madam Chair, you're in charge of public comment and recognizing people to come to the podium to speak. Okay. Um, so you, usually we have a three minute limit for them to give their public comment and you advise them that no action will be taken. We're just here to hear the comments. Okay. Okay. Thank you for coming today, ma'am. Whenever you're finished with your card, we'll, we're ready for your public comment. <laughs> your public comment is limited to three minutes and it is not the expectation that the committee will be able to give you any, um, what did you say? action, <laughs> sorry, based on your comments today. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Annie Sweblik, 511 North 3rd Street in Palatka. Um, I don't know if I 
totally understand this about the historic certificate, whatever you guys require. But I live in the North Historic District, but my home is not historic. It's from 1935, and we just painted our house years ago, peach with red trim color. And that might not be, uh, you know, a good look for a historic home, but we don't have an historic home, but we got TIF hip money uh, years and years ago funding. And that criteria was, you know, wasn't uh, a point then, you know, it was just to get the house painted and get uh, porches repaired and all that. So I, I hope you guys are not going to make it um, too difficult for people if not, you know, if it's not necessary that you just keep those criteria that if you don't have an historic home, but you live in the historic district that you still can get the funding and, you know, that you can score that way. Madam Chair. I guess my question is to staff. Okay. Um, they still, she does still pay into the TIF fund, right? Yes, that okay. is correct. That's that is correct. And any home within the historic district has to adhere by the guidelines for the historic district. I don't know when those guidelines took place. So I don't know if they were in effect when you had your TIF HIP program the first time. I have no idea because okay. I wasn't here then. Okay. okay. All right. Any other questions? Any other public comment? Public comment is closed. Yeah. How is the best method to set up the meeting for the second portion of, of this? Um, would it be easier if we sent out an email to everyone and did a poll so that you all had a chance to check your calendars? Is it because I don't know that you're necessarily prepared to do it right this second? Hey, Madam Chair, I have email request, request for a meeting. Either one of those worked for me. Okay. okay. And the email that Sunny, um, Ms. Cranch used for this meeting is all the correct emails for everyone? Okay, perfect. We will do that. I would anticipate, what, go ahead, yes sir. Madam Chair, one other question. Have we decided, uh, I guess, how long will we have to actually look at it before we try and bring us back together again? Whether it's a, be a week, couple of weeks or whatever. That's a very good question. Um, off the top of your heads, what time frame do you feel would work best for you? We'll just do a round table real quick. Two weeks, three weeks. Oh, at, a mi at a minimum, I will want three weeks. I mean, two weeks. I'm sorry, two, two weeks. weeks. I'm sorry. I'll go with that. Okay. Uh, three weeks would be more comfortable. Okay. Three so we're thinking somewhere between mid to late August would be comfortable yes. for everybody. So we'll send out an email with dates that could work on the city's end, looking at, at, that, at that span of time. Okay. okay. All right. That is, so that's all we have on the agenda for today. So Madam Chairman, if you would like to close the meeting out and adjourn, we're ready. <laughs>